Drive and ambition can be the fuel for your work ethic. You need to demonstrate it because hiring managers like to see it. Can you learn to keep it under control and practice balance? My guest today is a friend and mentee of mine, Uliti Fangupo. He and I became acquainted over two years ago when he reached out trying to better himself and take the next step in his career. He was in the middle of a UX boot camp and trying to prepare for the real world. In that process, he applied to over 123 positions with no success. Then the switch flipped. Give today's episode a listen and understand some of the details that tie into ambition and drive, an often double-edged sword that you'll need to learn to wield. Let's get it going. Uliti Fangupo. Close enough. Close enough? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Nah, you did that, that was pretty spot on. I always like to make fun of people. <laughs> I can just say Poe. Poe's good. I never got into that habit, though. No. Nah. Either one's good. As I just I've met people before that they they feel like they're gonna offend my ancestors if they don't say it right. <laughs> and those are the people that I want to make fun of the most. And yeah, Poe works. How many people call you Poe at this point in time? You know, it's interesting because um, everyone, all the white people do. Um, is Uliti too tough for them to say or what? Yeah, really. It's, the thing is, is they want to say it perfectly or they just want to go to Poe. Okay. And so I try not to lie to them when they say it wrong. Do I say it wrong? Yeah. How do I say it? Uliti. Uliti? Uliti. With a D. With a D. Yeah. Uliti? Well, Uliti. Uliti. Yeah, I won't begin that. Yeah, I know. So, then, all right, Poe, thanks for coming <laughs> thanks, on the show. Yeah, <laughs> thanks for having me. <laughs> That's exactly how it goes uh-huh. every time. <laughs> yeah, you know what's funny is I had a buddy of mine who was from Samoa mm-hmm. and when we would go out and we would dip, meet different people and they would say, where are you from? And he'd say, uh, I'm from Samoa. And they're like, where? Samoa. And they go, I- I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Yeah. And he'd go, Samoa. Yeah. And they're like, oh, oh you're yeah. from Samoa. And yeah. he's like, oh, my dad would kill me. You know? know. It's <laughs> the same thing with Tonga. I would say I'm from Tonga. Where? Tonga. Tonga. Got it. Okay. <laughs> and so I'm like... Nice. That's awesome. Welcome to America. Uh huh. Where we but, butcher your nationality. You know what? As long as I can stay in this country, you can butcher it all you want. <laughs> <laughs> I love it here. Well, I, well, never mind. I won't. I won't speak for our president. I don't know what's <laughs> happening. <laughs> yeah. Um. Let me. Uh. Again, thanks for coming on the show. I uh, yes, appreciate the to impromptu uh, podcast recording. Um. Tell those who are listening a little bit about your background. I do want you to talk about how you came here to the States because that's Mm -hmm. a pretty interesting story. But then also get into a little bit of uh, uh, your schooling and Mm -hmm. and then we'll talk a little bit about what happened after school and to where you're at today. So tell me a little bit. So I grew up in Tonga. 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 (laughs) Tonga. I grew up in Tonga for since and stayed there since I was 14. I played rugby out there. And then the University of Kansas, the Jayhawks, they had a trainer come and try to recruit uh, rugby players and try to turn them into football players. Sure. And they did that on a high school level. Um, and so I was one of the lucky few that um, they got, had the opportunity to come to America and go to Kansas. And it was huge because in Tonga, Samoa, Fiji, New Zealand, everywhere I went, America was the place. Really? Oh, yeah. Everyone. And so when I knew that I was going, dude, I, it was a dream come true. Cool. And so, and so my mom pulls me to the side and she says, you know, son, you're going to have to go, but you're going to have to go alone. Yeah. You know, we can only afford that. And so <clears throat> my mom sends me to Kansas and I remember landing in LAX, California the airport there. Yeah. I had flip flops, yeah. shorts, a Hawaiian t shirt, and three hundred dollars. And I remember my uncle picking me up, took me to Ross, bought me a long sh- a long sleeve shirt uh-huh. and took me back to the airport. And he's like, Good luck. Because <laughs> you're going to Kansas. Because I'm going to Kansas, right? And then people kept referencing um Wizard of Oz, but I didn't know it at the time. Sure. You know, and so so I went to Kansas and just knowing nothing. I mean, the even the weather was completely different. I remember we flew over Utah. Yeah. And the pilot came on and he's like, we're flying over Utah. And I was like, what's Utah? 
So I opened it up and I looked down and it's just all white. Uh-huh. So I thought it was kind of like a land that's just covered in white. Uh-huh. I didn't know there was an actual state. Uh-huh. And I just remember thinking, it's white down there and on the window, there's ice. There's ice around it. Ice around it. And I'm just like, holy cow. Like, that's crazy. Because mm-hmm. um, in Tonga, the fridge is the only place that has ice. Sure. Right? And so we get to Kansas and I remember the two... Um, <laughs> white people i guess yeah the the people picking me up they picked me up and they took me and i remember things were going super fast i saw the red yellow and green and i was like christmas lights yes <laughs> and um and i remember the people like uh maybe i'm going too much detail there but they were kind of arguing about me and i didn't quite understand because my english wasn't that great when i came but um i found later that that they they didn't know i was coming and they were just told and they came pick me up and they're trying to figure out what to do with me. Oh, okay. And so I go, I'm, I'm there at Kansas and I just had to learn America. Sure. I had to learn the school system. I had to learn the people, just white people everywhere was a culture shock in sure. itself. Cause typically where I'm from, it's only when the cruise comes over docks, the white people come off. All the ladies try to marry the white guys, <laughs> get a green card, and go to America, yep. right? And so just meeting all these different people were pretty awesome, but pretty scary, yeah, too, for a 14-year-old. And um, some people were super mean. Yeah. Some were racist. Yeah. And, um, and some were great. And yeah. some were wonderful. And I just remember telling myself that I got to adapt quickly to survive sure. out here. Well, and you know, it's funny because in that story, the reason I wanted you to share it is in that story, you can see, well, from my perspective, Mm -hmm. you can see uh, one of your, I guess, in my perspective, one of your primary traits, like your primary personality traits of like drive and hustle Mm -hmm. was demonstrated in just the fact that you came here to the States, you had 300 bucks and some flip flops, Mm -hmm. and now you had to make it for yourself. Yeah. And I think that... The, we're going to get into a couple more of those details, okay. um, but I, I think it, that that trait was demonstrated real early, and, and I'm sure it existed prior to coming here to the States, mm-hmm. but uh, it's not something that when we start talking about drive and ambition and hustle and that kind of stuff, like it's not a faked thing when it yeah. comes to you. And uh, anyway, so I, I just think that that story really capitalizes on, on yeah, this, this is how I had to make it. Yeah, and you know, it's it's kind of an emotional story for me because it was like I talked to <clears throat> I talked to other mothers, right? Yeah. And they always like when I get the perspective of the mother side of it. Yeah. <clears throat> it makes me want to work hard. Sure. You've got reason. Yeah. You don't want to disappoint the people that sacrifice for you. you sure. Know? So, but yeah, you know, it's, coming to America was not easy, but dang it, I would not trade it for anything. Sure. America is is the place. I love it here. So that's something that I think probably a lot of people take for granted, but let's fast forward then. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kansas. I don't want to say it didn't work out, but things evolved. Mm-hmm. You ended out here in Utah. Mm-hmm. Uh, you met your wife. Yep, yep. Um, mm-hmm. And then UX boot camp came around. Yeah. I know I fast, so that's for- a huge I, jump. I, I fast forward here real quickly, <laughs> but I want to get to the part. I know there's a lot of things that happen in between, but I want to get to the part that you came out of a UX boot camp. Uh-huh. And, you know, like many people who come out of the UX boot camps, then reality hits and it's time to find a job. Yeah. And I think the next point in this story that we're, you know, we start to demonstrate hustle, uh, it, it kind of picks up from that point forward. Your experience in school, I think, is probably similar to a lot of people's experiences in school. Um, but what happened after school, I think, gets a little bit different. If I could share kind of what happened during school, I think sure. that would be a good place sure. to start. Um like I had my family in in Las Vegas, yeah, right, and I had my kids there, and I went to Salt Lake for school, and I had to make money too while going to school, so I went and got 
gigs while I went to Dev Mountain. And I would go I would go to school from eight to five, right? And then from six to one in the morning I worked these gigs. Mm-hmm. And I did that every single day. And then when Friday hit at five, I would drive six hours to Vegas, be with my family for one day, and then drive six hours back. And I did that every single week. For how long? For the whole Dev Mountain experience. Was that thirteen weeks? Thirteen weeks. Yeah. And did that back and forth, and it was, and I want to share that part because, um, because we're talking about hustle, right? Yeah. It wasn't just hustle in school, but making sure that the family was good and, and the wife was happy. Sure. And so, it wasn't just go to school, figure out what UX is, how to learn the skills. It was trying to apply the UX skills in real life situations. Right. Because I knew real quickly when I went to Dev Mountain that they weren't teaching the business side of it. Yep. And I wanted that really badly. So I went and got businesses and, and learned how to work with sure. the stakeholders and everything. Mm-hmm. And so so it was kind of a dual schooling for me when I did Dev Mountain. Um, but then after Dev Mountain, um, I thought I had enough experience to get some something. Yeah. Contract, anything, right? But uh, it wasn't the case. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Sorry. Go no, ahead. I was just going to say, so for those who've listened and follow along on the podcast, they've, they've heard me talk about how I've known people who've turned in a hundred resumes. Yeah. And when I share that reference point, I specifically think of you because yeah. that was similar to your experience, right? Yep. It was exactly that experience. I, I sent out 123 resumes and a handful got back to me. And I don't know. Maybe I just didn't look good on paper. Maybe I did something wrong. I don't know. But I started asking myself, what did I do wrong? The wife was asking me if we've wasted money and mm-hmm. you wasted to doubt. time. Yeah, you start to yeah. doubt what happens. And then I can deal with self-doubt. But when my wife starts yeah. doubting, oof, <laughs> that's tough, man. That's yeah. that's the tough part. But, um, but then I kept going. I kept hustling. And I told my wife, okay, I will go work and do other things while I apply so that we can make money, keep us afloat until that point. So I built websites, you know, I, I did, um, I did labor work. I did whatever I could to keep our family full while applying to different places. Yeah. Why do you think it was that, I mean, what did you learn in that experience of turning in 123 resumes and only hearing back from a handful of them? What did you learn in that? It's a bad strategy. <laughs> okay. And I should have learned that quickly. At the, I should have learned that at, at application 40. Sure. Or sooner. Sure. That there was something wrong, and I didn't UX my own experience. Sure. Right? It's like, ask questions. What What are you doing wrong, Poe? Yeah. You know, and I waited too long to figure out what the problem was. And at this point, I don't know exactly what the problem was, but I think part of it was my mentality of how I was going about it. What was the mentality? Mentality was numbers. It's a numbers game. It's a numbers game. Put in the work. Because I asked everyone that came to Dev Mountain, I asked them how many uh, resumes did you put in before you got a job? Yeah. And they ranged from 1 to 120. So uh-huh. I told myself, get to 120 and you You'll got a job. job. Sure. So that's what I did. And the hustle mindset didn't scare you from that. Yeah. I was like, okay, get it in there. And I started applying everywhere. And... It wasn't just click, click, click. Yeah. I made it specific to each job. Sure. So it took a lot forever. of time. Ever. Mm-hmm. And just that was discouraging. <laughs> and, I, and I'm not good in English and grammar. And so my wife had to help me, you know, read through it and make sure it was good for each one. Mm-hmm. And she quit after a while. I don't blame her for it. But. <laughs> She learned at 40. She learned at 40. <laughs> she just didn't communicate that yeah, to me. <laughs> sure. But um, but yeah, grinded it out. And there was a point where it changed. There's two. There were two changes that happened. The first change was, at first, I was like, I need a job. I need a job. I need a job. Yeah. Second was, they need me. They need me. I went the other extreme. Yeah. I'm cocky. I'm awesome. I'm all this. The company's missing out. Sure. And then that didn't work either. Yeah. Right. 
And then it got to a point where it was like, the company will succeed with or without me. I'll succeed with or without the company. Yep. And so when I had that mindset and when I went and interviewed, that's when offers started coming. Do you feel like you interviewed differently at that point then when you changed your mindset? I think, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I remember the company I work with now, uh -huh. I went in and he says, he, he, he says to me, um, he's my brother now. I actually love that guy. But he says to me, you know, this is a contract role with the potential for employee uh -huh. uh, employment, yep. right? And I told him, like, you know, thank you so much. I appreciate that. You know, I'm here to help you get to where you need to be, but I would love to just stay contract. Yep. But however I can help you guys, I would love to do that. I wasn't, I wasn't like, please, you know, give Giving me the job, the give me the job, right. you know, whatever. It was just like, I'm good with me. Yep. And I know you guys are going to be good too. Let's just see if both our goals come together. Yep. And then now he, he put me to the side and he, he just mentioned that um, it was that moment that he said that he had to have me because I wasn't desperate. And so I wonder if I just came across differently in the 123 resumes. Maybe it came in my writing. Maybe it was on the phone interview. Maybe it was in the face interview. Maybe I just came across desperate and they saw that and good for them. Because I was. <laughs> you, you know, and the other thing I might say, though, is maybe it also just came across cold. Like, right? Mm. You slide a resume across my desk. I don't know you. I, and so, like, what commitment yeah. do I have to you? I've got a piece of paper in front of me, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I I would personally put this in another notch in, in the belt. And once again, soft skills led to the job opportunities, yes. right? It wasn't until real genuine personality like the real genuine poe yeah. was demonstrated that it opened up another door that. absolutely absolutely and i always talk about you know turning in the resumes it's 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 no different than the penny slots right right you drop in a resume pull the slot hopefully that works out and it becomes a numbers game you pull this slot enough and maybe you win but maybe it takes 123 resumes before you win Maybe it takes 123 to figure out just to be yourself. It might, right? Right. And, and so I think you, you learn some of those intricacies. Like, I, I don't actually, I mean, because I knew you through the process. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't remember exactly what point in the process I came into contact with you. But, you know, I wouldn't say that uh, you changed, like, over the course of it. Mm -hmm. I think you were consistently you. But, you know, maybe in those interviews, you were more naturally you. Um, once your mindset mindset shifted, you know, I think I think I talked to you differently than I did with all the other. Why is that? Because I reached out to you. We didn't even know each other. No, in fact, I think it just occurred to me. This is our first time we actually meet in person, isn't it? No, we met at Domo one time for lunch. Oh, you came in for lunch. Yes, that's right, right, that's right. And then, um, but this is still our second time. Yeah, but I've known you for. About a, a year. year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I just remember I saw your name connected to a dev mount person. I just saw it and I was like, I'm going to reach out to the guy. Uh -huh. And I remember messaging you and saying, hey, is Domo hiring? And then that's where it all started. And I just remembered that you cared more about my growth than any other employer that I talked to mm -hmm. at that point. And so I was like... Even if it doesn't work out with Domo, even if it, nothing comes out of this, something did come out of it. And and so I looked at you as a friend sure. more than I did as someone trying to help advance my career. Sure. And and maybe, I don't know, maybe I should have just did that. Taking that approach. Taking career. that approach, right? It's like just trying to find a mutual uh, agreement that we can help each other yeah. instead of who can I talk to to help advance my career. Right. And I think that was a mental shift that I had. And now people just message me on LinkedIn and say, hey, you want to come interview? And, it, and I respectfully decline and stuff. But I really do think that people can tell if you're really in there to to be helpful or if you're coming there with just a me attitude. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's the best way to say it, but no, I do. I something think, happened there. I so. think a lot of people go into the interview thinking that they need to sell themselves. Yeah. And so it doesn't like their natural personality doesn't come out and you can see the flaw in that, right? Because if you go in acting in, you know, something that's not natural yeah, and they hire you, 
and then you become natural? What if at that point in time, that's not who they wanted? Like, what if the, you they were sold on the person that they interviewed? You're in trouble. <laughs> You're in trouble and they're in trouble, right? Yeah. And so I, if, if I ever hear, if somebody says, you know, it wasn't a good fit for me, I say, great. You know, because if it wasn't a good fit for you, it wouldn't have been a good fit for me. Right. You know, and so at the end of the day, I want to find somewhere where it's going to be mutually beneficial Mm -hmm. and having that mindset of, you know, can we help each other? And if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. I think that's a great mindset to go into. Yeah. And I think the other thing, too, is um, is relationships and getting to know other people. Yeah. You know, not for the sake of connections, but for the sake of connecting. You know what I mean? And. Because the job I have now came from an interviewer that interviewed me for mm-hmm. a different job. Mm-hmm. And so he connected with me with someone to connect with someone that brought me to where I was, sure. where I am now. And yep. so, you know, and so let me plug another different story. Um, I feel like people tend to get the whole networking thing backwards, right? When they first get into it, they look at networking as how can I advance my my personal goals based off of knowing this person. Yeah. And it's not a natural relationship. I mean, how would how would any relationship go if you went into it going like, I'm going to benefit from this, whether you like it or not? Yeah. You know, it's not going to work out. That wasn't how you approached me. Um, yeah. And I remember one of the very first things you asked, you know, you were asking, do you do I have any projects mm-hmm. that you could help on? And Honestly, I, I've been hit up with that question a few times. And so I don't know what actually spurred me to say, okay, I'm going to give this guy a shot. <laughs> uh, I, I wish I could put a pinpoint on that, but I don't remember what it was. Uh, but I remember what happened after is like we were working on a freelance project. Yep. You weren't actually involved in it yet. You would later become involved in it. Um, and I said, here's a design that I just got finished doing in Sketch. Uh, I'm going to... I've built out this design already in WordPress mm-hmm. and you're going, have you considered doing Webflow? Yep, yeah. And I said, no, I haven't because I think this is going to work for me. Um, and you said, well, well, give me the design and, and I'll mock something up for you. Yep. And that night you turned around a, a Webflow website that looked almost pixel perfect to the design that I had done. Okay. And it wasn't it wasn't the fact that it was pixel perfect that stood out to me. Mm-hmm. It was the fact that you were willing to do something with no promise of anything coming your way in return. Yeah, your willingness to just say, "I'll put my head down and get to work and uh, and just demonstrate for you uh, how I could help." And that was what really I don't want to say sold me on you, but that's what showed me character. Yeah, is here's somebody who's going to put. Um, you know, he's not going to get tied up in the details of like, well, how much can you pay me? I'm going to give you three hours of my time tonight mm-hmm. or six hours of my time tonight. How much are you going to pay me for that? You know, we didn't get caught up in this. It was just like, let me prove myself. Right. Like that mindset you embody. And again, the drive, the hustle, the ambition, uh, and the, the, the mindset of let me prove myself, I think is what has in my mind made you successful in, in how you've gone about your work over the last year. You know, I, I agree with that. I mean, one of the benefits of coming from a second world country is that it's a win every time. Sure. Like, even if I didn't get paid, I just felt that like being in America, being healthy, like you're in a place where poor people are fat. Like, I just, there was so many blessings yeah. that I was just like, even if it didn't work out, I, w- I was able to learn Webflow. I was able to build a relationship. And so... It may have been a loss to other people, but it was a win for me. Yep. And so, I I don't know. I guess I guess. I dude, I was willing to work for free for three months, four months, six months, whatever it took to prove myself to anybody. Sure. You know, and um, you literally were the first person outside of the company I am with now mm-hmm. that that gave me a flipping chance, and it somewhat pisses me off a little bit. Sure. You know what I mean? But if, uh, being on their side now, interviewing people, I get it now. You know, you, you, you guys are trying to find the right people. There's legal issues, too, with hiring and all that. Mm-hmm. But, um, man, I just wanted someone to just give me a shot, and I was going to give them the world. So and, how do you, now that you are on the other side of the, mm-hmm. the coin, how are you paying it forward? Okay, 
That's a great question. I think I'm still a little bitter, to be honest. Okay. I think if I'm completely honest, okay. like I want people to fight for it, mm-hmm. kind of like I did, right? Because no one gave me a flipping chance outside of you and the company. Sure. And so I kind of want to see people fight for it. I want them to get rejected. And that's part of the bad side of me, right? <laughs> but then the, I appreciate the honesty. Yeah, I'm just, that's, that's just how it is. But the moment I see it, I'm not going to make them keep fighting. I just sure. want to just see it just a little bit, right? Um, but back to your question um, about how I pay it forward. So this is how I do it. When I hire people, for example, I had a developer, right, who's super talented, but he was kind of lost in the weeds, or he, there was a cloud hiding his talent because there were so many other developers. And I I noticed that he had did something that literally is going to make the company money. Mm-hmm. And so I told him, hey, come in. I know it's an hour drive, but come in anyway. And then I brought the executives into a room and I had him present what he did himself. Sure. And I could have just taken the credit of manage being an awesome manager and got got this feature out and it's working awesome stuff. But I was like, I want that guy to win, you know? And so I try to, I try to prop him up, you know? And so now he's one of my product owners, Sure. you know? And so I try to pay it forward by, by giving people opportunities. I just hired a guy and they asked me why I think he's the right person to hire. And I said, I think we should hire him because I think he can take my job. He's, he's qualified. He has the interpersonal skills. He has a technical side, which I don't have. And I think maybe in three years he can take my job, you know, and Mm -hmm. I want to hire those kind of people. And so I guess I try not to limit people and give them an opportunity to prove themselves. And I try to trust people first, unless they give me a reason not to. Um, but I don't know. I don't know if that was a good answer to your question. No, that's, but that's fair. I try to go out of my way to like to to help prop people up. And honestly, if people come to me right now and say you need a job, I'll figure it out. But holy cow, if they come to me just expecting it, then that's one thing. But if they come to me and they're like, dude... I've been fighting. I want to win. That means something to me. So, and so we were talking a little bit about this before we got to recording. <clears throat> Obviously, drive and ambition is something that means a lot to you. Mm-hmm. Um, but you do recognize that not everyone has equal drive and ambition as you. Yes. So, are you going to end up building a team of people who've got your drive and ambition, or not to my level, or maybe more than where I'm at? But at this point, I want some of it. I want people to have it. It doesn't have to be intense. It doesn't have to be 123 resume. I just don't want ambitionless, if that's even a word, people. Sure. Apathetic. Yeah. And and maybe that's a bad management style. And I'm totally open to feedback. No, I, I, I think just... you've got to have a, a level of drive and ambition. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I can totally reciprocate the fact that you don't want to just give this job to somebody who thinks they're entitled to the job. Yeah, had that. But it doesn't work for but me. But there are a lot of characteristics and personality traits that can make an individual successful. Ambition and drive is one of them. But there's other skill sets for those who lack ambition and drive. And how do you go about recognizing those strengths in order to build the team that you're you're building? I guess I don't know how people I guess ambition and drive is everything to me mm-hmm. because I've seen talented people get outworked by someone less talented. You know, I just seen Talented people, they go to waste because they don't have ambition or drive. I don't know. I feel like ambition and drive is brings all their talents and makes them better. It makes them more empathetic. It makes them care more about what they do. Mm-hmm. It, it. I don't know. I just, I don't know if I would ever consider bringing on someone that is just there for the money. And maybe that's a bad thing. And I'm open to feedback. But, and I'm just playing the devil's advocate here, that's but I, okay. I don't think that 
just if they if they don't have that level of ambition and drive doesn't mean that they're there for the money. No, I understand that. Yep, yep. Matter of fact, that's interesting that we bring that up because um, one of my mentors at the company, he says, I kind of like people that are just there for the money because it's clear cut. You yeah. know, it's, it's not just like, here's, here's, yeah, it's not complicated, right? Here's the task, everything I need you to get done. You'll get paid this, just get it done. Yep. And it, that's where, that's it, right? Yep. And so I guess for me, it's like, I see the value in that. I just, I have a short life. I want to, I want to live it with people that want to live and just fight. If that makes sense. No, and I, and I get it. And I guess <clears throat> the metaphor that I would draw from it is ambition or hustle uh, or drive it that's kind of like the fueling agent for somebody's mm -hmm. personality like without it yes you can be very empathetic you can uh, develop the skill sets but with more drive and more ambition you can develop those things maybe quicker or mm -hmm. you can recognize the things that you need to be working on uh, and you've got the ambition to work on them more quickly mm -hmm. and so maybe it's more of a fuel that goes into somebody as opposed to like the pinnacle of their personality that's a fair point yeah, it doesn't have to be their biggest thing. Right. Right. But they need a little bit of it. Yeah, for sure. Like, yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. You know, it's interesting, the, those concepts and the themes that you learn along the way, because I've obviously, I've got my own personality. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, when I'm hiring, it's, it's hard to... It's hard to discern the personalities that you're going to work well with and those mm -hmm. that you're not going to work well with. And it's funny is I have act, I've never worked with somebody who's just like me, but I've worked with some people who are similar to me. Yeah. And I don't know if it's always the best thing in the world, right? I need people to That's balance. I need yeah. people to balance me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've got one of these guys who I've worked with now. I'm going on six years and I feel like he is a great balance to me where, uh, you know, we just, we complement each other. And, um, and I think that does help build out a, a well-balanced team, but I don't know if that's saying the compliment to your ambition is the lack of ambition. That's why I'm saying, I don't think they're in the, the same category. I think the ambition is more the fuel to the personality that's than, fair. than uh, saying, well, we can get away without ambition. I don't know. No, I, <clears throat> no, I, I totally get what you're saying. And I think that's a very fair point. Um, that's what I'm saying. Like maybe I'm maybe I'm still in my bitter state. You know, maybe it's my turn to be like fight, you know? Um, but that's just the thing. I, you know, I always love learning then. I still love learning now. I'm always open to feedback and having people um tell me, you know, trying different things. Yeah. And so I could be absolutely wrong about how passionate I am about finding ambitious people. Sure. And I've met like the developers I work with right now, they show ambition differently, right? And that's great, but I know, I know that when that guy does his work, it's not just for the money. Mm -hmm. He wants to do it because he is proud of it. Yep. You know, and I want that, and I yep. love that. And it's just, and I, I just love working with people that they know that they're gonna go to the grave, and maybe it's too dark, but they're gonna go to, the, to a grave and feel like they gave everything they had yeah it doesn't matter what even if it's a conversation or or in a meeting you know that you can count on them to just give it everything they got yeah and maybe there's another word for it for me that but yeah i i'm not discounting other people what their strengths are and stuff um it's just a really big thing for me yeah no i, I totally get it <clears throat> I, you just triggered something else in my mind that i was just thinking of uh I've had the 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 recollection or the the experience over the last couple of years to to recognize like you know what is it exactly that I'm trying to get out of of my career mm -hmm. and what is it that I'm trying to personally improve on and you know I had somebody who was who was an intern uh, for me not too long ago who made the comment to me that you know Doma was the dream job like this would mean the world to him mm -hmm. and while at first I thought. That, well, that's that's mm. flattering. My second thought was like, oh, that's sad. <laughs> I love that comment. I love that. And I, <laughs> my thought was just like, I said, well, don't let it be your dream job. And yeah. he was kind of taken aback. I was like, I, I, it's not my dream job, and it's not a, it's not discrediting everything great about where I work. 
Um, but it's just like, there's, there's more to life than work, you know? And that was kind of like a, a mind shift change that I've had over the last couple of years is that I love that. I want you to be passionate about your work, but I also want you to be passionate about going home. And I want you to be passionate about your hobbies and I want you to be passionate about your family. And I want you to be passionate about your loved ones and your friends, because at the end of the day, I don't want you to go into the grave, you know, apathetic, Right. but I'm also not as concerned about you going to the grave going like I achieved all my career goals because at the end of the day, there is more to life than work. Absolutely. And I like to see that demonstrated in, in a, in a well-balanced person. I like to, I like them to know that work is important, but also life outside of work is important. I think you're inspired because if there's one thing that I, that my wife says that I need to work on is to stop working. I yeah. like my job right now I literally go in at 7.38 and I go home at 5. I cook dinner, have time with the family, put the kids to bed, and I go back to the office yep. at 7. I don't have to, Yep. but I love it. <laughs> and it's just, and my wife and I, <clears throat> I work here, but we're building a business on the side, building tiny homes, Yep. you know, for Zion's National Park. And then we'll accomplish this, we'll accomplish this. My wife kind of tells, my wife kind of feels like I should slow down a little bit, mm -hmm. maybe perhaps balance my life, kind of mm -hmm. like what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And so, no, I think that's inspired that you brought that up. And, my and wife I don't, would be happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not saying this on a pedestal. I'm saying this of my personal experiences I've gone through and my struggle. Mm -hmm. You know, I just had one of my students ask me, uh, you know, you, you do your podcast, you do your full-time job, you're teaching, uh, and I'm sure you've got other things going on how do you maintain a, a work-life balance? And I say like, dude, I don't. Like, I'm struggling. You, yeah. What you don't see when the cameras are off and the microphone's off, what you don't see is that I've got my struggles and I've got my issues. And, you know, last night was a perfect example of I went to work at 9 a.m. or what did I go? Went to work at probably 8 a.m. yesterday morning. Mm -hmm. uh, worked till 5, did a podcast recording from 5 to 6. <laughs> ate dinner with my family from 6 to 6.30 and then taught night school from 6.30 to 10.00. And it's just like, there's no balance in that. That I mean, that is a day dedicated to work. And so I'm, I'm cognizant of the fact that my kids say, Dad, can you come play football with me? And I say, no, I got to go work. And that type of stuff just like eats me up inside, right? So there's, I'm not the master of balance. I'm trying to figure it out myself. But, so let me ask you this question. Because I know with my wife, well, <clears throat> there's we have something in our family called the weekend blues. Okay. And it's something I get when there's nothing to do. Oh yeah. You know what I'm saying? Uh -huh. And so my wife loves it when I work because I'm so much happier. Yeah. And I don't know if you're the same way. Um, but it's kind of hard because my wife wants me to to kind of balance it out, but she knows I'm gonna be miserable too. Yep. And no, so I'm you. still trying to figure I'm trying to figure that one out too. But. So I'll just share what, because I totally get it. It was Tuesday night that I, I did a podcast Monday. I did a podcast Wednesday. And both those nights I had school, night school. Mm -hmm. And so I, I was blocking out those nights for like, those are my work nights. Tuesday and Thursday tonight were going to be my free nights. Mm -hmm. Tuesday, I was bored out of my mind. I, like I told I my wife, guess. like, I don't know what to do. I'm twiddling my thumbs and I'm on Instagram. Like, I don't know what to do with myself. Yeah. I, I'm bored. And one of the things that I found, because I'm typically pretty decent at avoiding it, is I as much time as I spend planning my work, mm -hmm. I need to spend time planning what I'm going to do when I'm not working. And those things are like, hey, when I get home from work, That's fair. I'm taking my kids to, we're going to run over to Dick Sporting Goods. We're, we bought a couple baseballs and then we're going to the park and we're actually going to play baseball, right? And now I'm, now I'm staying busy just in a way that to me is more a meaningful busy. You know, it's it's putting my time back into my family where I personally get a lot of value and and I guess energy out of. Mm -hmm. And so I have to spend time to cogn cogn cognitively uh, figure out what I want to do with my family when I have that free time. Otherwise, I'm bored out of my mind. Yeah, I should probably adopt that. And so one of the issues with me is like, if I'm going to do something, Let's make money doing it. I get it. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, and then I and then I look at my kids and I feel bad for my kids sometimes because they have a dad that's just weird. 
and I need to be a better dad. How old is sure. your oldest? My oldest uh, one is, is my son. He's three. Okay. He's turning four in November, and then my daughter is almost two. Okay. And, um, <clears throat> but yeah, I, I, it's, this is going to sound really bad. It's going to go online, <laughs> and my kids are going to listen to this in the future. But like, I think, like, how do I make money when I spend time with my kids? <laughs> you know? Yep. My, my mind is just dumb that way. Yep. But it's always like, not dumbed, just programmed just, because that's you, yeah. you're built, built to hustle. Yeah, and I and I come, I know what poverty is. Yep. You know, not having water to drink, and the pastor has the key to the water. Like I never ever want that sure. for my family, yep. right? And so, I don't know. I it's it's really, I know that I'm a good planner, and I can plan and balance my life out better. It's more of an emotional issue. Yeah. <laughs> Childhood problems that so, not resolved. <laughs> I, I get it. I'm going to share one more thing with you. And I, I, when I share this with you, I, I want you to understand I'm not coming from a pedestal. I'm coming from what it was that flipped the switch for me. This uh, man would love to hear it. I, when I, this is, goes back, my, my oldest just turned seven Saturday. And when he was four turning five soon, uh, I was really passionate about the hustle, the freelance and mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff. And I was really passionate about my lawn and keeping up like the landscape because I really enjoy that. And uh, my dad made a comment to me when I was coming home from work. He's like, well, what are you going to do tonight? And I was like, probably spend the next couple hours in the lawn. And he says, oh, interesting. He goes, well, just remember, Jameson's only five for a little bit. And it just hit me like a ton of bricks that you're right. Like Every hour that I put into my hustle or my passions or my mm-hmm. side projects is another opportunity that I've missed with my child at this stage in their life. And now he's seven. And guess what? He's not five anymore. And I mean, if you want to get real sentimental, I'm going, and in 10 years, he gets ready to move out of the house. And I'm going, and you don't get that back. And so that's why I've had this like recollection of like, he needs me now. The other thing that happened over the last couple of years is I started to go through therapy Mm -hmm. is I've recognized that some of my negative characteristics and traits he's already starting to pick up on and kids are smart (laughs) and it's not that he's had me like drill it into him he's just watched me do them yeah and you know when I started to see my son experience like different anxieties I'm going he didn't learn anxiety watching tv reading a book or somebody telling it Mm -hmm. to him he learned it by watching it you know, by, by seeing an example of it. And he saw my inexperience. Yeah. (laughs) And my lack of, uh, awareness. And he, he just saw me struggling and it's become part of him. And that really drove me down this path of, I don't want to say self-awareness because I think that's cliche, but trying to, I don't sure up my weaknesses and give my kids an adequate amount of time and attention while still, again, I'm going to say, I'm not saying your hustles are bad. I'm saying in balance yeah. and balance. And that's why I've got to really block out Mondays are work, Tuesdays are kids, Wednesdays work, Thursdays are kids. And that's, that's how I'm having to balance like what I'm really passionate about, but also giving the family the time and attention that they need. And I say need, not, not the not time and attention they, they want, want, they need. Yeah. My wife, Bought some books for me to read. <laughs> and I promised her I would read them about being a father, being a, a better dad, you know, spending time with everyone. And so, yeah, hopefully I will get that switch. Yeah. Because I, I want to spend, t- I want to want to spend time with Absolutely. them. Absolutely. I don't it. want it to be just like, oh, this is a flipping chore. <laughs> Kids get in the truck, let's go play baseball. And I can only play Legos for so long before yeah. I go nuts. Yeah. Like, I don't know. I, I gotta. I gotta figure that out for sure. And this is definitely a different direction than I thought yeah. we were gonna go. But I guess here's what I want to tie it back to: is drive and ambition is good. <clears throat> Just don't forget what is important as well in life. Yeah. And I hope that anyone who's listening recognizes the balance that is obviously crucial to a happy life. And I hope that people take the same amount of drive and ambition towards their career. And they also spend that same amount of drive and ambition into whatever it is that they're passionate about, whether it be their spouse or their kids or their loved ones or friends or hobbies. Your career is great and you're going to need it, but balance it. 
Yeah, there's a certain point where you make this amount of money and nothing on top of that mm-hmm. adds any more happiness. Yeah, there's right? a, there's actually a number. I, I think it's like seventy five or seventy seven thousand. Something about that. Yeah, yeah. That I just came from a place where I saw children suffer because there was no money. Right. You know, and 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 maybe maybe I'm I'm over adjusting too much. Yeah. You know, and so I need to balance that out. But yeah, hustle, hit that point, and then make sure that all the other and stuff balance it. Yeah, because yep. if the f- wife and family is not happy, it affects your work. Absolutely does. It's like crazy. So, Absolutely does. Yeah. Um, we're just about out of time now, so let mm-hmm. me. Uh, if people want to reach out and connect with you, maybe ask a few more questions. What's mm-hmm. the best way that they reach out to you? Just reach out to me on LinkedIn. Okay. Uliti Fanupo. It will be spelt in the description so they don't yes. have to rely on my pronunciation. Yeah, just reach out to me. And honestly, like, um, if you have questions or anything, I would love to help out cool. the best that I can. Cool. And um, I don't have a budget for everyone to come on board, but um, I am looking to help people that are really cool. fighting for it. Well, I appreciate your time. Thanks for coming up and uh, spending a moment with me. Thanks, Dylan. That's a wrap for Design Today. Okay. <laughs>